Westville Bell Pottery in Nova Scotia. Um, I'm actually going to throw some large baking dishes. Um, I did some this morning. Let me show you. They weren't very big, but I got these from this morning I put together. So I'm going to show you how to do this. And, uh, I have lids for them as well. So I've made four of those and I'm going to try making another four but two very large ones too. A little bit, a bit easier to put it down. I usually bang square blocks down when it's smaller but it's a bigger piece so I'll basically round it off a bit make it easier to center. This is fairly stiff clay it's about six months old in my studio. I always get my clay delivered twice a year usually in May and then I order it again in September for delivery in October and the reason for that is I've had clay delivered once that was been frozen uh, and that is not good so I never do that again the clay's been frozen you have to wedge it and that's a lot of work so coning up first kind of get a feel for the clay and when it's six pounds like this it's a lot harder to squish it and move it around so you've got to talk you have to talk to it persuade it and this is actually number 80 clay from Laguna clay company it is an overproof clay so it's got a tooth to it, like a little speckle. It fires a browny red color. I just did a test with it with Randy's Red Glaze on it and it looks good. That Randy's Red Glaze seems to like clay bodies that have iron in them. I'm running another test tonight where I double dip the Randy's Red and I, what did I do? I double dip, oh I increased the soak temperature to an, uh, 40 minutes because the Randy's Red seems to like it a little hotter, like cone 7 but I'm doing this one to 22, 32 and then I'm actually going to increase the soak to 40 minutes from 20 minutes to see whether there's more red. The reason I'm doing that is I'm hoping that we had a double dip this Randy's Red with the other glazes, but are the other glazes like a cone six? And if I go up a bit higher than cone six with like the turquoise I have and also the blue, you tend to get little blister bubbles, so they don't want to go any higher. Now I'm, I'm going to have a fairly wide base on this too. So I can stick to my fingers a little bit. This clay is quite stiff. But that would be good because it will hold out, overhang quite a bit without collapsing. Which just means you have to talk to it, persuade it. Alright. Bats just moved on the wheel too. I know we all face that. The pins on this friend are probably quite eroded away. Being so old. Throwing with a sponge under my finger to keep it lubricated a little more. This red clay tends to stick to your fingers more. Seems like it absorbs the water faster. Now you've got to leave a fairly wide top to these because you've got to put a, a little gutter on them to actually accept a lid. I'm 
taking it back in a little bit there. And flatten that top down a little bit. And when you're doing baking dishes, they tend to get a little bit of, you know, banging with the oven racks and stuff. So you've got to make them a little thicker than you normally would. It's good for the heat distribution too, because if you have thin clay, the heat gets through really quick. And where the clay gets a bit thicker, in other places it might crack because of the, just, you know, the difference in uh, thermal expansion. So now I'm using my little rib to put a groove right in the top. Once I've got it established, I'm going to get some water in there. So the rib will basically glide a lot easier. There we go. So I've got a deep rib, groove. And I just use the rib to squash that flange down. Now I'm going to do a bit of shaping. And I'm going to do a double kind of lip area there so I can put the handle from this area up the top there. I can exaggerate that a little bit. Just by turning the rib around and doing a little pressure, you can actually create that so you'll have some interesting glaze areas and you might be able to just carve in between it for a little decoration. Now let's get the water out. Once I've got the water out, I'm going to stretch it a little bit more. This wheel makes quite a bit of noise. Somebody told me my brushes on my electric motor probably need to be changed, but then I figure it won't be, so I'll change the whole electric motor. So until it breaks, I'm just going to keep with the noise. It's the only wheel I have that makes this noise, and I guess it has the right to make a noise after 35 years or so. Yeah, if you buy a Brent, it's buying a wheel for life. with the shape a little bit. Just using the metal rib so it doesn't drag too easily on the surface. And I'll try and round it a bit more. I think this clay can take a little hanging out because it's fairly stiff. Actually, I might just leave it like that. Nice little curve there. So, so let's take it off the wheel and measure it. I'm going to make a lid. I think I made my balls of clay for the lid a little too small. So I've got two I can put together. So. This is what you call a little lip master. These are old too. I probably should clean this one. When you open them up, you have to worry about little bits of dry clay dropping inside your pot. So I always hope and move them away from the piece. There you go. I'm giving myself about a quarter inch leeway there so I don't make it too tight. 
And a lot of times, what well, another thing you can do that's good is just open up that lip just a touch, not widening the whole thing, just giving it an angle so that the lid can slot in there nicely. And let's measure it just to make sure it didn't change too much. Nope, still right. The glaze has a thickness too, and since I glaze the entire, the, the lip will be glazed. I find my lids uh, off the pieces because those new Kelm shelves, the advanced ones, are totally flat. And, um, and so you can fire your lid right on them. Sometimes I fire lids on stilts too, so I can glaze everything. Let's lift it off. Give you a look at the profile. All right, so it's a much wider than the one I threw this morning. Now, when you make a baking dish, when I'm cooking myself, I always run out of space in the oven if it's a big meal. Then, uh, so you end up with you know, double racks. So you don't want to make your lid too tall. I'm pretty sure this is going to be too small. But I want it to be fairly shallow with the lid. See how fast this dries out? This clay has a real strange absorption thing. My white clays don't dry out anywhere near as fast when you're doing a pull. But the other work plates with the iron in them tend to drag on your fingers a lot more quicker. See how big I can get this? Because now it's got to hang out a little bit. Wouldn't it be funny if it's too big? So when you realize I better check this. Oh, it's perfect. Well, I guess I didn't need to worry. But that surprised me. I didn't think I could get that from that one and a half pounds of clay. You don't have to, you just have to dry things. So, so I'm going to dry out the edge there. So that's a very flat lid. How far under am I? Oh, I'm a long way under. So I've got to be careful. a little rounded mess there, and then I'll measure it again. I like my lids to be a little more dome-like, so that's kind of flat. Yeah, that's perfect, but um, there's a one and a half pound lump, and there's another one and a half pound lump. So because that other one was a little tight and I couldn't really get a dome with it, I'm going to take some of this one and steal it. And then if you're going to put two together, make sure you don't trap air in between. There we go. So I should be able to get a stone with this one. Because I put two together, I'm going to coat it a little bit just to make sure they all stuck really well. And that pressure pushing back down will really help seal those two pieces of clay as one. So a dome lid is a little taller, that's what I was about to say earlier. Um, you don't want to take up too much space in an oven with wasted space because if you've got a dome lid it's not like you can contain liquid in that area. Compress that center area. That way you don't get s cracks. And I'm gonna have a bit of a pull because it's gonna be trying to get a dome lid.
I keep this wheel just for red clay, because I don't do as many red clay pieces as other pieces. And because it's old, I guess, I guess I'm just babying it a little bit by not using it as much as the other ones. Okay, so that's a good ball, but it's not going to be wide enough, so I'll have to lower it. So let's get all the water off. Once you lower a ball, it's a lot more likely to collapse, so get all your water off before, so you don't have to do any sponging once it's really low. And just to be safe, use your metal rib and support it as you're lowering it. And now I'm gonna measure it, because I think I'm getting close. And yep, I'm a quarter inch out. So that's a nicer shape lid, I think. I gave myself a quarter inch in the calipers on the lid, so I want to make this one tight. Yeah, that's tight. So I'm just going to knock it in just a touch. And that'll be perfect. Alright, so that's the second thing you need. And finally, you need some handles off the other piece of clay. This might be a bit small, but we'll see. Now because it's these are gonna be the handles, I don't need a bottom in the piece. I'll go right through the bottom to the kill to the actual bat. Now you've got a big curve on that jar right through. There you go, there's the back. But you need to lift this up, leaving it thick at the top. And it's got a good curve on that, that uh, casserole, so you want to make sure you've got enough to cut out. And I'll show you in the next part of the video when I do this, but lift up. And leave it thick at the top. Don't thin it too much. Now I'm really giving myself a straight wall area there. And if you want to decorate this, you could put another groove in, like I did with the lip. I gave myself a double ring there. Actually, there's three rings almost. So the glaze will slot inside there, give me a decorative. Right, time to put handles on. This is the baking dishes I was doing earlier. Using the heart, these are those cylinders I made. Basically, right down the center, pull whichever direction you want to go. And then right opposite, down again, whichever direction you want to go. You've got to make sure you go through all of them. If you don't have one of these hearts, you can make one with rebar and tie a guitar string across it. So that gives you four little lugs. Now timing is everything, so basically 
this piece is sticky and these pieces are smudgeable. They're really kind of sticky. Or and scratch. I just have one of these loop cheese cutters to cut when I'm trying to cut something. Okay, so that will be a lot nicer, I think, now. Also, be careful with your eye, making, you know, you want to make sure that you've got a good angle here, and then when you feel like it's good, just move around. That's tacked enough. This one's had time to basically soften up a bit more now. But they are very soft. I'm doing these and I can still change the shape of it if I'm not careful. So we can have a look. Make sure it's down. I just had to go to the right a little bit. So I can get handles for two pots out of one little cylinder that I threw like this. And then, using something to soften your fingerprints a little bit, push back from the inside as you're pressing those down. This doesn't means I don't leave fingerprints on the inside. You need a little resistance when you're pushing something down, otherwise you'll end up maybe getting little cracks opening up. Old paintbrush basically, the, the bristles have kind of been worn away quite a bit. It's the one I used to put handles on all the time because like a little bit of the metal acts like a little wooden kind of modeling tool. Get the water off as much as possible because water sh makes the clay shrink more. Then the same underneath, you just kind of smudge it then and put a little pressure on as you're doing this backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Hi, Mirandi. My cat has to have attention. Somebody mentioned he's, the cat's very distracting. Well, try being me. <laughs> he's, he sits on my pieces sometimes. And he's always getting cat fur on everything. Okay, now, I never like it to be like a hard edge like that, but you might. There you go. So it's got these hard edges. So I simply take this tool and put it in towards the pot and pull it out and just give a little curve at the end. And that softens that edge, which I think over time has a tendency maybe to get chipped if people are catching it. So by rounding it, maybe that's a preventative measure. You've heard from the beginning of the videos that I have um, seagulls right outside the window here, so my cats love to get up here because they can watch the seagulls. I also feed them at the back of the table there. So. All right, so, and you can work on this. I actually take a little bit of clay, and once I've got the angle right on the sides there, and you know, I've got stamps, um, clay stamps basically that I can actually make um, textures, patterns, whatever I want to do. Um, but right at that corner there and right at that corner there, there's a potential to get little cracks opening up. So I put a little button there and just press with a stamp. And that will 
if anything did open up like a little crack or something, that little button is going to compress that area and stop that from happening. So there you go, same again on this side. Yeah, you can kind of anticipate with experience if you're likely to get a crack. And for me, it's right at that point there. So by taking two little pieces of clay, and you don't have to do balls, you can actually make, you know, just a little coil with a little curly, you know, sort of spiral made out of clay or anything you want, basically. But I put it right there where that join is. And it helps to compress that join when I press the stamp in like that, so that it will stop it from cracking. And that's the handle. So the knobs are easy, a little piece of tiny bit of clay. You're gonna be like throwing off the hump. Just make tiny little balls on top of the big ball. Pushing with your finger. Throw a little, depending on what size you want. I like because it's hot. When you take these out of the oven, you probably should make sure that they're big enough so you don't drop it out of your oven mitt. And then just very slowly cut off where you want to cut off. Slow the wheel down. It'll just lift up. And you got a knob. Okay, next you need to trim the lids. These are the little balls that I threw. So now I have to trim them so I can put the knobs on. So you simply get your giffing grip or a, whatever you're using a wheel head for trimming. And round off that little bump that you have there. You can actually make that a decorative element too if you want to, but I'm just gonna round these off. and I'm going to stick a knob on there in a few minutes. This one was the one I threw that was very flat and because it was so flat I stuck a sponge underneath it to actually lift up the dome area and then because I don't really like the lids to be totally flat so stick that sponge in the center place the center over there it will hold the middle up a little bit continually curve that one a little bit. Now the top of it is very thin. I'm just going to knock off any rough bit that I've got over there. There we go. And that's that. So the other two I'll do the same. Alright, so if it's small enough uh, needs to stiffen up a little bit. I can put them on the wheel. I just threw the knobs and I just scored the top of these just by scratching and adding a little water. Take a knob, make sure it's not got any hole underneath so it can actually harbor some air and you simply attach it to the top. My fungus finger stuck and I got the rings on the wheel so I can see if it's in center, slightly off, move it over a touch. Of course it doesn't have to be totally in center since nobody's ever going to be spinning this around once it gets into a kitchen. It's nice for you to know that it's pretty good. And then I usually put a little bit of water inside there with a brush and just put some pressure down. And then use the, the, the bit of the brush that has like a bit of metal. I think there's a name for that bit of the brush, but anyway, so you can Push the, use the metal to push a little lip of that clay that's on the underbit of the handle into the lid. And then just clean it up. Pushed off a little bit, I'm going to push it over a little bit.
it still moves, you just keep working at it till it feels like it's really sticking. This piece is quite hard and the new piece is quite soft. The brush is pulling it a little bit too, so but as long as it's close. Alright, that's one. And then I'm going to go back at these as they're drying when they're not quite as soft as this. Now this one, and I will straighten them up a bit, this one's a lot bigger. Now there's a sponge underneath there because this was that flat lid I threw, which I wasn't quite happy that it was flat, so I just put a sponge on it, it pushes it up a bit to leave it home. This is the biggest lid of the lot, so I'm going to use the biggest one I threw. The sponge will resist, which is nice too. So I can put a bit of pressure down. The lid is, this is the softest of all lids actually. And then I've got a wooden tool here, if I, instead of using the brush, let's make sure that's fairly centered. A bit over that way. there. So this could go over just to touch that way. And then use the brush, the modeling tool. To push that in there. And like I said, when they're a bit sort of stiffened up, the top part, the knob itself, you can go back and actually straighten these up a little bit. See, it's so easy to move them, but they'll stiffen up. Basically, baking dishes, what do you have to be careful of? Uh, the clay can go in the oven, because not all clays go in the oven. So make sure your clay company will tell you or not. I've got three clays that they tell me go in the oven, a white one, a speckled clay, and also this dark red, but I prefer the dark red one. Um, it actually, uh, um, the knobs on some of these are a bit tall, I think. Um, but uh, it's another elegant thing. I like seeing a big knob on the, on the piece, but it, for functionality in the actual uh, oven, it'd be nice if it wasn't as tall, but then you can't grip it very easily because when you're wearing an oven mitt and you want to look inside, stir it up or something while you're cooking, you'd need to be able to lift that lid off fairly easily. Um, so that's important to note. Uh, okay, here's the casserole. Just needs a little bit trimming off the bottom area there. Okay, you can do this just by fastening it down with lugs of clay if you don't have a giffen grip. Um, trimming tool. Casseroles do not need to be thin. They should retain the heat when they come out of the oven by having some body and weight to them. And also that aids in thermal shock, of course. If it's thin in places and thick in others, there's more chance it will crack in the actual oven. So don't worry about making these things too light. So that's got my shape, so it's a smooth curve now down there. I'm not going to hollow out the center because I don't want to reduce the weight there either because that um, it doesn't want to be thin here and thick there too much. But I just like to define that edge a little bit. It just shows you're taking care of the bottom of a piece, which, um, okay, nobody looks except for potters, at the bottoms of pots really, but um, potters always lift them up and I take a look at what's underneath. Okay, so that's a little groove I've made there so I can get my fingernails in there and hold it upside down if I have to basically uh, glaze something on the top. I don't want to dip the whole thing, so I like to have a little groove there and that will actually help. And then just, uh, let's see which one of these, I think I'll use this one. These are the potato peelers, just for a little fluting on the bottom part. Be careful, I've got the handle there, so I don't want to hit the handle. This will help make the glaze look 
like it's breaking from dot to light where it goes from the high point in between the flute. The Randy's Red Glaze I've been doing uh, really is working well now. I'll post a quick video on the update on that too soon. I've got a kiln going to go up tomorrow just with Randy's Red pieces in it. The first full firing with just Randy's Red. It's working good now. Okay. And if you want, I can actually increase that groove a little bit there. Just to make sure my fingernail will sit underneath there easily. I don't have much in the way of fingernails. Can you see it or not? You can just see it in the light, a little bit of fluting there. Of course, this is a time, if you wanted to, you could actually do other elements just on the top area there. If I wanted to kind of, I don't remember how thick I thrown these, but I can probably do this. days all right there you go so give yourself a nice little accent at the top of the piece and then the lid just goes on there so I won't drag this out too long I've got eight to trim um, so that's you know I may post a little bit at the end of this video of them being glazed but um, but that's the casseroles all right talk to you soon thanks for watching and a special thank you to Kimberly in uh, Texas and also Claudia in uh, Illinois, in Chicago area, I think. Um, uh, thank you very much for ordering those pieces. All right. This is Vaughn Smith at Westcote Bell Pottery in La Have, Nova Scotia, uh, saying stay safe and be careful. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.